in view of the time constraints, I'll just uh, run through a uh, brief. The, my presentation is mainly from the perspective of the Southeast Asia. I think uh, some of the keynote speeches today have covered those issues, so probably some of them may be repetitive, but I'll try to, the, I'll try to be brief. First of all, we'd like to emphasize Southeast Asia is one of the most vulnerable regions in the world to impacts of climate change. And I'll briefly touch upon what are the physical and economic impacts because ADB has conducted a economics of climate change in Southeast Asia study two, uh, about two years ago. And uh, I also briefly touch upon food insecurity in Southeast Asia, impacts how climate change can impact food security and the issue of water stress and food security, and especially in Southeast Asia, because these are all island economies primarily, how the salt water intrusion is going to impact uh, food security. And also the relatively neglected issue, how the impacts on the private sector. I take the food and beverage sector as an example, based on the study by uh, World Resources Institute and HSBC. And then briefly talk about the role of the non-climate related stresses which are equally important in terms of uh, affecting food security. Why we Southeast Asia is highly vulnerable? Of course because it's a highly exposed areas, islands, deltas, coastal regions and uh, there is also high concentration of population uh, along the coast and high economic activity in the coastal areas and more importantly these economies are highly dependent on climate sensitive sectors like agriculture and food uh, water resources and of course almost uh, like 80 million people are still malnourished and uh, they have low adaptive capacity and the urbanization issue was already uh, uh, touched before. So the, this is a joint study with ADB and if, IFPRI uh, where uh, we found out that south, most of the Southeast Asian countries uh, are already having high exposure, high sensitivity and also low adaptive capacity thereby contributing to the uh, high vulnerability. So this is the map uh, created by uh, the Environment and Energy Program uh, supported by the IDRC Canada. So the whole Southeast Asia, of course, the uh, darker the red is, the most vulnerable it is. So if you can look at most of the region is uh, basically highly vulnerable to impacts of climate change currently. So the future impacts will be, of course, more serious. So what are the observed physical impacts? I think I'll be very brief here. I mean, this was already touched. For example, in most countries in the region, number of extreme events have increased, and uh, the uh, number of rainy days have decreased in certain areas. The, uh, those uh, details are there. I mean, it will be uh, circulated to you. But basically here we wanted to say that the extreme events and the number uh, in terms of floods, droughts, and also the sea level rise. For example, sea level rise, uh, they, uh, there is almost like 15 to 25 centimeters per decade uh, in, in Indonesia and Philippines, and it's about uh, uh, 10 to 12 centimeters per decade uh, around Vietnam and uh, uh, the uh, Thailand area. So this is per decade. So these are the current observations. And uh, if you look at the flood-related damages, for example, it increased by eight times. Direct damage caused from the tropical cyclones increased by 35 times in 1990s compared to 1970s. For example, in the Philippines, the typhoons alone in uh, 2009 costed around 3% of the GDP. And uh, more importantly, uh, by 20, uh, if there is a one meter sea level rise, many of these countries in this region uh, lose almost like four to five million hectares of uh, arable cropland. Uh, that's very serious in, uh, in various countries. The important thing is that the ADB study shows that the uh, worst is yet to come and without urgent action, mean temperature in this region may increase by 4.8 degree, degrees centigrade and sea level rise may be uh, about uh, up to 70 centimeters by 2100 from 1990 levels. These are much higher than the global average. And if you look at the economic impact itself, it could be as high as six point loss of 6.7% of the GDP, uh, if you look at the four countries, four major countries, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, and Thailand. And this is again uh, twice the global average loss due to climate change. That is what uh, uh, we found out from this mini-stern review on economics of climate change. 
So then I want to mention that food insecurity has, uh, is already a problem. There are around 80 million people uh, still undernourished and uh, the frequency of localized food crisis is increasing. Uh, food security, uh, climate change is going to impact on all variables of food security in terms of uh, availability, affordability, accessibility and also acceptability in terms of safety, etc. So how it's going to do, if we look at the three dimensions of food security uh, in terms of productivity, connectivity and resilience, climate change will impact all those uh, components. Uh, when we say connectivity, for example, in terms of floods, the infrastructure limitations, uh, even though we may have fo uh, surplus food in other regions, it is not easy to transport that uh, into other areas when the connectivity is lost. So the climate change is going to impact the connectivity issue. That's why infrastructure also is very important. And of course, the resilience part we, we have already discussed. And uh, some examples, I think this will be a repetition of, uh, uh, because this is basically ADBF3 joint study that was done two years ago. Here again, Southeast Asia impact on rice production could be as much as uh, uh, reduction of 20 percent. And uh, uh, I think this is uh, already shown, I mean, in Asia it's, uh, and Southeast Asia. This is a, Another example how different crops, uh, maybe around 15 to 25 percent in various countries, the reduction in losses. And in terms of calorie availability also, there may be about to 17 to 18 percent uh, uh, reduction in calorie availability. I already referred to the resilience part. I mean, many, many of the ecosystems are getting degraded in this region. And, uh, uh, and one of the key areas is, as was identified before, water stress. Water stress is going to be very serious because the uh, disruption of the hydrology of the many river basins is happening very rapidly. And uh, this has a lot of impact in terms of uh, huge loss in both rice uh, lands as well as uh, fish production. And uh, the shifts in precipitation patterns are also causing uh, widely in both Mekong region as well as in Indonesia and the Philippines. And the shrinkage and desiccation of the wetlands that is having a serious impact in terms of uh, degradation of ecosystems. And the other, other issue that I talked about the salt water intrusion. And uh, by 2030, it is expected that uh, salinity intrusion could be as, I mean, almost 20 kilometers inward in case of Vietnam. And uh, obviously, the, most of the productive agricultural lands are within that 20 kilometers. And of course, uh, so it will have drastic impacts in the Mekong uh, food system. And uh, also disruptive impacts on the marine ecosystems. Uh, because most of these economies are dependent on marine uh, resources. Again, that will have a lot of uh, uh, food security implications for the uh, uh, coastal populations. And then uh, I will briefly touch upon the impacts in the private sector. Most of the private sector in this region still uh, is not thinking about the impacts of climate change. So the World Resources Institute and the HSBC has conducted a study how the declining anim uh, crop and animal yields will lead to, uh, uh, um, I mean, climate change will reduce the productivity but also increase the uh, prices for uh, uh, agricultural inputs. So this basically what is saying is agricultural input prices will increase, processing costs will also increase, and food safety concerns will also increase. They have done these uh, uh, seven or eight, seven subsectors, how uh, the imp climate change is going to impact the different uh, subsectors of the food and beverage sectors. If you look at uh, edible oil, starch, and sugar, the crop prices will increase, animal yields also in aquaculture, Processing costs, for example, you can see uh, it will increase and food safety problems, especially in the dairy, poultry, and also aquaculture. So these are all related to the uh, climate change impacts. So, and uh, the one, one more issue that I wanted to mention is non-climate stresses. This region is, uh, again, I mean, there are many problems with the food distribution and mismanagement and also, for example, in the, uh, along the major rivers like Mekong, this dam building plans also will have a lot of implications for food security, perhaps more than what climate change could bring. 
and price volatility is a big issue. Biofuels has been an issue. Overfishing in this region, both by uh, the regional and also extra regional uh, sources, and also the transnational land leases. Uh, in Southeast Asia, many other countries, I mean, for example, Korea, China, and other countries are uh, uh, um, leasing uh, lands for the sake of improving food, food security of their countries. Obviously, it will have implications uh, within the Southeast Asia also. So then I will briefly touch upon the uh, seven policy options, what, what needs to be done within Southeast Asia. The first and foremost, I believe, is that uh, mainstreaming climate change concerns in agricultural policy and water policy. Bo if you look at the National Agricultural and Water Policy documents uh, within Southeast Asia, the word climate change you do not see much. And basically, climate variability is effectively considered, but climate change is not considered. What will happen in 2050, 2030, these are never addressed in the designing the national agricultural policies. And of course, uh, the uh, Southeast Asian countries are doing some good efforts in terms of, it was referred to uh, earlier DG's presentation, I mean, in terms of Asian plus three emergency rice reserve system, which is likely to come by October 21st and buffer stock creation, etc. And similarly, some of the countries like Indonesia and Vietnam, they are also progressively implementing some climate change policies. But the linkage between the food security policies and the climate change policies is still very weak in all countries in the region. That is why this integration aspect is very critical. And secondly, the strengthening the research on the nexus between the climate change and food security, especially within the Southeast Asia, is very limited. Although almost more than eight CGIR institutions are somehow operating in this region, but still the research findings on food security and climate change within this region are still very limited. And uh, it is also complemented by weak national agricultural research systems uh, uh, because they have also uh, relatively neglected this issue in terms of food security and climate change. And the traditional agricultural models, we believe that uh, in these countries will not be adequate to cope with uh, uh, future impacts of climate change. And we need more access to the new crops and technologies, and very little research has been done on those. So that's why strengthening the research, uh, the CGIR program on climate change, I mean challenge program on climate change, agriculture and food security, probably can make a difference, but probably it also needs substantial resources. And the third issue of the food, water and energy nexus, here the energy demands are increasing in the region, both Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand, and there is an increasing uh, 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 would say a focus on looking at the energy policies separately from the water policies and uh, food policies. For example, just today, uh, the dam construction on the Sayaburi uh, in along the Mekong was uh, uh, not agreed upon by the Mekong countries, and uh, this is causing a lot of uh, conflicts in terms of uh, how we use the water for production of energy. And what implications does it have food security? So the issue of integrated policies has, again, uh, received much li limited attention so far. So how do we really look at the, uh, even cassava, for example, 95% of the cassava produced in Thailand is going to just for production of biofuels in China. So how, what are the implications for that? Again, energy versus food and water. Uh, so those issues have been uh, uh, considered very uh, in a limited manner. And again, I mean the climate proofing of the uh, agricultural and water infrastructure, that is another issue that has been uh, paid very much limited attention. And the third issue, I mean fourth issue is adaptation technologies and investments. The IFPRI study, uh, I mean joint ADB study uh, showed that as much as 3.5 billion dollars will be required within Asia itself uh, to improve adaptation. But how do we uh, generate those or mobilize those resources? Again, it's not well known. Uh, how this Green Climate Fund will be designed and how the Southeast Asia can benefit from the Green Climate Fund is yet to be known. And there is one example of the pilot program for climate resilience in Cambodia. Probably that type of uh, programs need to be scaled up and uh, replicated across the region. And uh, the other issue is the uh, uh, issue of insurance and uh, early warning systems. Again, there are some trials, for example, in Thailand. But again, there is very limited acceptability of the crop insurance programs. And even early warning systems also is not working well. 
And the fifth point is about Red Plus strategy. Given the Indonesia and the Malaysia, I mean many uh, this region's forest resources, uh, now many countries in the region are developing national red strategies, but without paying much attention to the food security of the forest dependent communities. How can we really design an effective red, red policy uh, with the equitable benefit sharing mechanisms that will contribute to the benefit of these forest dependent communities? It has been, re uh, it has been, I mean it is being addressed to a limited extent but not in a satisfactory manner. So much work ne needs to be done on that. The fine, I mean last but uh, the mitigation and adaptation synergies. I think if we look at only the mitigation, obviously if, if we encourage farmers not to use fertilizers or not to use much water just because of the energy concerns, obviously it will have implications. The food production will go down. So if only focusing on mitigation will obviously reduce the productivity. But at the same time, fo only focusing on adaptation. Adaptation will require a lot of money, as I mentioned, $3.5 billion per year within Asia. So if we only focus on adaptation, obviously the cr crop value will increase again, prices will increase. So it is important to build good synergies between mitigation and adaptation strategies within this agriculture sector. And this has uh, received very limited attention in global climate change negotiations. And of course, there is some progress and FAO has done something and CG institutions are also, I mean, including IFPRI, have been uh, on the forefront to appeal to the international audience uh, and climate negotiators to include this issue. Finally, I mean, the regional cooperation issue. Most of the issues such as food security and climate change cannot be addressed within national borders and effective regional cooperation is critical. And in that way, I mean, ASEAN, there is a re organization, but still it needs a lot of uh, uh, efforts to do. They have an ASEAN climate change initiative, which has been dormant for a long time. Again, I mean, because of limited capacity, limited resources, etc. And uh, of course, the external, I mean, GMS, Greater Mekong Subregion, Mekong River Commission. There are some sub-regional bodies, but these have been uh, fairly, been mainly as platforms for just discussion rather than implementing effective policies across the region. So they need to be uh, reinforced, they need to be supported uh, both uh, internally, I mean within the region and also outside. Thank you very much. Thanks.